Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Bettbus, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Adriana Miramontes Olivas, the new curator of academic programs and Latin American and Caribbean art at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. Miramontes Olivas earned her PhD in art history at the University of Pittsburgh, an MA in art history from the University of Texas in San Antonio, and a BA in art from the University of Texas at, in El Paso. While at the University of Pittsburgh, Miramontes Olivas served as the Assistant in Museum and Community Engagement in the Department of History of Art and Architecture. She worked for the Art Gallery at the University of Texas at San Antonio, the Stanley and Gerald Rubin Center for the Visual Arts at the University of Texas, El Paso, and the El Paso Museum of Art. Miramontes Olivas oversees the JSMA's Latinx collection, which has been one of the fastest growing areas of art in the museum. Thanks, Adriana, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be. Muchas gracias. Es un placer estar aquí. So, tell us a bit about your background. So, I was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, and I basically grew up in Ciudad Juarez, the border between the United States and Mexico. I used to cross the border every single day when I was doing my bachelor's degree to uh, attend the university. So, it was this daily back and forth between countries and cultures and languages, and also ways of thinking and being. Um, more recently, as you said, I was at the University of Pittsburgh, and there my research uh, focused on global contemporary art with a focus on Latin America, and more specifically, looking at the Mexico-US border. I examine responses to violence, um, such as those that we've seen in that border area, uh, such as the feminicidios, the murder and disappearance of women, but also masculinicidios and juvenicidios, the marginalization and murder of men and youth as well. So you've already started to answer my question, which is how has your identity as a fronterista, a border resident, shaped your approach to the study of art history? And you've sort of begun to explain that, but why don't you say a little bit more about that? The term fronteriza is a term that I just recently started using, uh, probably 2018 or 2019, after I was having a conversation with a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh, David Tenorio, and he asked me to consider where do I write from when I'm thinking about the border. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm in Pennsylvania at a distance, but at the same time, I'm very much connected to the border. All of my family is there. I visit then for personal, but also professional reasons. Um, at the same time, I have been sort of like immersed in US culture since 2005. Yet, um, I'm always negotiating and doing all the paperwork to acquire visas and passports. So many times I feel like I am not from here, nor from there, ni de aquí, ni de allá, but also I am from, from here and from there, de aquí y de allá, which is the definition of fronteriza. And so, you know, living in between cultures, the borderlands. And so, in my research, in, 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 in my studies, I focus on artists who pretty much promote an idea of global citizenship and mobility. Uh, open borders. So um, you started to explain more in detail about your research, so tell us a little bit more about your PhD project. Well, I conceptualized the term neoliberal archivos, which is basically the neoliberal archives, and they respond to several factors. One of them, for instance, being neoliberalism and the opening of borders at the border, at the Mexico-US border, with the border industrialization program that happened way before the institutionalization of NAFTA. Mm -hmm. So it happened in 1965 where the maquiladoras or factories were being sort of created in the area but also shaping the urban landscape and lives. And so uh, that's one of the responses of the neoliberal archivos. They also respond to what Hector Padilla, a scholar from the borderlands, uh, defines as a politica de negación, a politics of denial, where the state basically negates or diminishes the violence that happens in Mexico. And the other aspect 
is that they respond to sort of like grassroots activism. Um, since the 1990s, when we saw, when we witnessed the beginnings of feminicidios, there was this group uh, called Grupo Ocho de Marzo, uh, a group made out of families of the disappeared, mostly women, mothers of the women, and so Grupo Ocho de Marzo began to archive the disappearances. More recently, for example, Maria Salguero created the Mapa de Feminicidios in Mexico. Yvonne Ramirez created a map that focuses on feminicidios in the area of Ciudad Juarez. So the neoliberal archivos respond to this sort of like a lack of official archive when files go missing from government offices. Um, and adopts what the activists are doing. The neoliberal archivos are contemporary art responses uh, in installation, photography, video, uh, to what happens in the country as a declaration, basically, uh, of what is um, taking place, but also as a protest. So the artists, I argue, they oppose the violence, and that's why they present it. Um, so yeah, so the neoliberal archivos uh, you know, examples of artists include Teresa Margolles, Adriana Corral, and Enrique Hesic. So you've just talked about the Latin American art that's being made on the borderlands. Tell us a little bit more generally about other movements in Latin American art at this time. Well, uh, major trends in contemporary art include uh, an emphasis on giving voice to marginalized communities. For example, at the 22 Venice Biennial, we saw in the Mexican Pavilion a work by Fernando Palma where um, there's dresses to make a reference. Well, there's 43. The number 43 is key as it relates to the disappearance of the students from Ayotzinapa. And so there's a f f total of 43 pieces, but these are dresses and they're children's dresses. And it's an installation, it's a mechanical installation. And you see the, des the dresses descending all the way to the floor until they collapse. And so, you know, the students of Ayotzinapa, he's a reference to a marginalized community who were basically going to protest for, for rights, human rights, and then um, several groups disappear them, right? In the same pavilion, we see the work of Mariana Castillo de Val who basically did another installation, but this time over the floor. And so there were sort of like carp figures. The figures looked like references to codices, you know, from Mesoamerica. Uh, but uh, the, the story is not linear to sort of like break away with master narratives, but at the same time, um, to create new histories, right? And so to talk about coexistence. And so, you know, giving voice to those marginalized communities, the indigenous that have been silenced. That's a major trend. In Mariana Castillo de Val, one of the figures is sort of like a hybrid creature that i never seen in a codex. Mm. Um, it looks like a dragon, and the tongue of the dragon is sort of like getting close to the mouth of the figure of an individual mm. as a reference to the erasure of languages. So that uh, is one trend. I would say the other trend in contemporary art, and more specifically Latin America, would be um, emphasis on the environment. Mm -hmm. So for, for instance, the, the pavilion representing Chile was another collaboration, and it was an installation, and so the environment is surrounded by plants. As you walk through this pathway, you enter a, a different area surrounded by screens. In the screens, there is this sort of like film being projected where you only see the shadows of figures mm -hmm. as a reference to indigenous populations that we have said that they're gone, they're part of the past. Uh, but you also hear, not only you see the shadows, you also hear voices and rituals. While you're there, uh, members of the biennial ask you to, they give you sort of like um, oil and they ask you to rub it in your hands and smell it. Mm. So there's this appeal of different senses within one installation. Prior to, before you actually leave the pavilion, you can also, you're invited to touch the plants that surround the space. So that emphasis on, on earth and climate change mm -hmm. and taking care of the environment is the other major trend. And I, I think, you know, the ESMA, we see that as well with our current exhibition on 
on Earth. Uh -huh. Fascinating, fascinating. So you, you've already mentioned the JSMA. You are not just a scholar of art history, you are a museum curator. So what does a museum curator do? What's that job entail? So in a, you know, like a brief summary, three main points, I would say care for the collection, right? Um, making sure it's seen so that there's more research, but also making sure it grows, uh, planning exhibitions, and then because we are an academic museum, also engaging with the university and the students, the faculty. So for example, one of the activities I recently organized was the visit of contemporary artist Juan de Dios Mora. And so uh, his prints are in the collection, but he, his work is also part of a traveling exhibition, Many Wests, mm -hmm. Artist Shape and American mm -hmm. Idea. So we invited him for those, you know, for those two reasons, uh, so that you know, we can care for the collection, but also talk about our ongoing programming through the exhibitions. Um, yeah, so. So tell us about Many West. Tell us about that exhibition that's currently the big show that's currently on show at JSMA. What's important about it? So it was uh, co-curated um, by, my, by my colleague and other um, curators from five different institutions. It has a total of 48 artists and probably more than 50 artworks. It's a traveling show. And the main idea is that it's giving voice to marginalized communities uh, that have been erased from histories, um, discriminated uh, among them, Latinos, but also um, indigenous, LGBTQ+, Chinese, or, or Chinese American, Japanese mm -hmm. American, Asian American. Um, so the exhibit uh, raises their voices and asks us to rewrite histories. It's also sort of like breaking with the canon uh, whereas, you know, the canon and our history and the museum field have been sort of dominated by Eurocentric views, the exhibit is in a way decolonizing the institutions and decolonizing knowledge. So talk, tell us about a, a specific Latinx work that's in the show and, and how it does this decolonizing work. Mm -hmm. One of them, uh, one of my favorites is Laura Aguilar's. Um, Laura Aguilar has a, a, a photograph there is sort of like a self-portrait, except that the artist is not facing the camera. Viewers actually get to see her back. So um, that, that work speaks on several levels. Uh, the image, so, so that you can imagine, uh, the figure is on the ground, is outdoors, and you don't see anything of the landscape except some rocks and the soil. Um, so the location is unknown, basically. Um, something that I love about it is that when I was talking to students, um, you know, I always assume, well, it's, it's the female body. But one of the students, oh, it's a he, they said. And so I really like that because um, Laura Aguilar identify as, as queer and chicken X. And um, the fact that we can read her work in, in this particular case in both ways mm -hmm. uh, really amazes me. Um, the other aspect is that she really struggled to be recognized in museums and to enter galleries. As a matter of fact, one of her pieces is herself, a portrait of herself with a sign that says access. Uh, mm -hmm. She was looking access into the art world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by having her work here, we're doing that sort of decolonization and giving voice to this artist that uh, struggled in the 1990s. So I mentioned in the intro that um, one of your areas of expertise is Latin American and Latinx art, and that the JSMA, their collection of Latinx and Latin American art is the f one of the fastest growing parts of the collection. So tell us a little bit about that collection. How big is it, and, and what, what, what's in there? What's important about that collection? So we have a variety of artworks. We have uh, photographs, prints, textiles, paintings. Um, we have the strengths of Cuban, Cuban art. We also have several pieces from, by artists from Puerto Rico. Uh, I would say we, one of my goals is to have more pieces by artists from Brazil, uh, Haiti, uh, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, El Salvador, Ecuador. Um, so yeah, so I'm currently working on hopefully the acquisition of four pieces um, but it's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of work. Um, we have a recently published catalog on Cuban art, mm -hmm. con contemporary Cuban art. Um, so yeah, so trying to 
make those areas growth, but also look at some of the weaknesses, right? So to say. <laughs> say a little bit more about how how art how a muse an academic museum acquires art. How does that even happen? What what's, what does that entail? Well, there's uh, different methods. One is by donation, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we are very fortunate here at UO that there's a lot of people working with us. Um, we receive um, suggestions for donations and a very, you know, not daily, but very often. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one way. The other way is um, reaching out to artists and seeing, you know, what is available, first of all, and also uh, how can, can we afford it? And if we can't, then trying to do sort of like fundraising campaigns to, you know, grant writing to acquire more works, uh, but also um, just buying, buying pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. So um, you are also involved in the outreach of the JSMA to the local Latinx community. So tell us a little bit about that aspect of your job. Well, um, one of my major roles since I started in August has been reaching out, first of all, to UO and um, courses and directors and programs that, for instance, focus on Latinx uh, communities. We have the Latinx Scholars Seminar. Uh, there's also Herencia Latina. And we also have numerous courses that uh, are from Spanish, right, Spanish. Um, so I have been reaching out to all that faculty, introducing myself, but also um, sort of like co-imagining together how what we have on view or in the collection can be used in their curriculum. Uh, I have also been working with community partners more, more recently uh, for the Day of the Dead celebrations. And so, um, you know, for this one, um, it's basically organized by Adelante C and Mecha, the UO. Uh, so I'm sort of like the project manager for this, but the, the outreach that um, this, this project has is immense. And so we even had people coming from Florence to visit the museum. Uh, it was also advertised in Portland through our partners in the Mexican consulate. Um, so that's, that's another aspect. And then through exhibitions, I, I hope that exhibitions and information being presented uh, bilingual in English and Spanish at the museum that we could um, show how open we are to our communities. Tell us a little bit about the Day of the Dead celebrations that took place at JSMA. There's quite extensive, say something about them. And, and the, the um, Mexican consulate, uh, the head of the consulate was here, is that right? Yeah, say a little bit more about the events. Yeah, so the event uh, has several components. One of them is the altares or ofrendas. So the Day of the Dead, I want to say, is a celebration open to all. Um, you know, um, someone who have lost a loved one, for example, this is a nice way to remember them. So in the altares, uh, photographs of the deceased can be placed and we invite basically anyone who wishes to do so to, to go ahead and place the images. Uh, so the altares and the ofrendas are one thing. There's also dance and music. Uh, we have a group from uh, Mexico coming all the way from Mexico City, Alma de Cuerdas. And then we also have um, the, the, the singers. And then, of course, local groups, uh, for example, uh, Ballet Folklorico Colibri. And so um, the, it's a celebration of life, but also it's a reminder of how ephemeral and transitory life is, right? Um, more than anything, I also want to emphasize that it's an opportunity to create community, to being together, sharing experiences and thoughts. How many people attended? Well, um, <laughs> we're still trying to figure that out. Um, we have a rough estimate of 400 people. So that's, that's something else we are thinking about as we move forward in our planning with our partners, um, Armando Morales and Rebecca Urhasen. Mm -hmm. So um, you are the curator of academic programs. What does that mean? What do you do in that role? It's a day-to-day -day engagement with the faculty and students, um, not only from UO, but from the surrounding areas. 
just recently we were at, we were interacting with Lane Community College as well, um, and they were visiting to see many Wests, but also they engaged with Juan de Dios Mora, and they had you know conversations with the artists. Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, just this, this term, I was doing some reflections and I actually met with 400 students uh, from different departments, all the way from comparative literature, LGBTQ+, museology, um, Herencia Latina, the Latinx scholars. So um, the question is, how can we get other departments to also see us, the museum, as a resource? I want to emphasize that UO is very fortunate because not all universities have a museum on campus. And not only that, the museum is free. <laughs> so I know in the past, as former faculty member, I had to you know, ask departments for money so that my classes could go and provide equal access to students. I'm very aware of um, you know, the, all the different backgrounds that can be in any class. Mm -hmm. And so I have had to, to negotiate with departments. I have also had to remove sort of like required textbooks so that in lieu of the textbook, they pay the museum admission for one entry, mm. you know. So here at UO is free. So, you know, really to take, the invitation is to take advantage of that. The other thing is that the museum can be seen as a classroom space. Uh, for for research for a study, but um, most importantly, and you know, just having COVID um, still around us, right? But the sort of like the shutdowns and all of that part of the recent past, um, the museum can be a space for creating community uh, to allow the students to interact with each other, to get to know each other as they are exchanging ideas in an intellectual environment, right? Um, so, so you, you mentioned in passing that you were a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh. So do you get the opportunity to teach while you're here? Well, I was faculty member uh, in sort of like the transition between the master's and the PhD. Uh -huh. At the University of Pittsburgh, I was teaching, but I was teaching as a graduate fellow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure about teaching here at UO. I haven't explored those opportunities. I'm focusing on the curatorial aspects mm -hmm. and and serving the UO community from a different um, from a different space, which is the museum. So, tell us about one or two of the upcoming programs uh, that the JSMA is offering for the university and for the community. Upcoming programs. Yeah. So, I would say, well, we had a very busy fall schedule. We invited. Um, you know, as part of many Wests, we are one of those few institutions that had had so many artists visiting. And so we had uh, B. Maldonado, Kaye Leferl, Juan de Dios Mora, and Mary Watts. And so um, for, for the upcoming terms, we have What We Leave Behind, which is an exhibition I'm curating. It's, it's, it's a small exhibition. It's about five artworks from four different artists. So I'm planning some programming with um, one of the filmmakers that uh, inspired the title of the exhibition, but also one of the artists. And so that's one thing. We also have uh, contemporary Chinese photography. And I need to talk more to Anne Rose to see what, uh, you know, what some of the plans are for that exhibition. But we also have the Common Seeing mm -hmm. exhibition um, in the near future. So tell me about this What We Leave Behind exhibit that you're curating. Say a little bit more about that. Uh, you explain the title. You say it's from a film. Say, say a little bit more. Yeah, What We Leave Behind, um, the title is coming from a film. It's a very accessible <laughs> a film. Um, in, and basically is looking at what is happening to, um, in, con in contemporary society. And so some of that is, of course, uh, immigration, immigration reform, and uh, the treatment of immigrants um, in several countries, but also here in the United States. Um, it's also about the reasons that um, force people to be on the move. So the basic idea of the exhibition is presenting mobility as a fundamental human right. So some of the artists include Juan Carlos Salom, Sandra Ramos, 
um, and um, Norma Vila, Norma Vila. So you, this is a show that you're curating, and one of your jobs, obviously, as a curator is to curate shows. So do you have any other shows that you're imagining in the future that you'd like to do? And to tell us about those. Yeah, so for, for April, I am organizing an exhibition with Tania Candiani. Tania Candiani is an artist based in Mexico City. She recently had uh, uh, works at the Venice Biennial, but the past one, and her work is very much focusing on the environment, right? We were talking about trends in contemporary Latin American art. So it focuses on the environment, water, for instance, but also women's rights. And that's one of the main reasons um, I am interested in her work. You know, feminist practice is part of my research. And so it's a one piece exhibition. It will likely be in, in the APS gallery, the first gallery that you see as you enter the museum to the left. It's a video piece, uh, but she does a lot of sort of like performance. And so in this piece, she worked with almost 200 women in the subway of Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been to the subway in Mexico City, do you, you know how busy it can get, hectic and chaotic. So I'm just really, I really admire the fact that she ha created the artwork in that site. Mm. Can and you say a little bit more about it? What, how yeah, did that mean? yeah. She was filming in that space, is that mm -hmm. how she did it? So she was studying uh, the maps of water as, as it was happening before the invasion of Spaniards. And so, you know, Mexico City is founded on Tenochtitlan, the land, right? And so we have, built the modern city on top of the ancient one. And so she was studying those flows of water, uh, but at the same time looking at how bodies sort of like move in space, and in this particular case, women's bodies. So I believe this is a feminist piece because it, women are claiming space, claiming the streets through their bodies. And so what she did is looking at the past and some, um, and looking at indigenous cultures, she sort of appropriates a drum mm -hmm. that some sources argue was used by men and in this piece is used by women. And so this Mesoamerican drum is being played by almost 200 women mm -hmm. at once. So it's a sound piece, uh, but at the same time you hear the metro and <laughs> other things that happen in the Mexico City subway. Um, yet, because they're walking and they're together, so it's a collective body, um, you can see the force of the presence of the body in public space. Fascinating. Yeah. So Adriana, we're, we're at the end of our time, so I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for joining us at the University of Oregon, and we're really looking forward to all the work that you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. I've been speaking with uh, Adriana Miramontes Olivas, the new curator of academic programs and Latin American and Caribbean art at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>